Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of Jeremiah, Persecuted Prophet. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Watsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of Jeremiah? Well, we're about to begin chapter 10, and Jeremiah is an interesting uh, figure in that uh, God called him to be a prophet while he was still a teenager. Uh, he called him during the reign of King Josiah, a righteous king, a reformer. And his ministry lasted more than 40 years. It was 40 years from the time he was called to be a prophet until the Babylonians conquered and destroyed uh, the nation of Judah and carried off most of them into exile. Uh, he was a lonely man uh, because God forbid him getting married. Uh, and he suffered a great deal of persecution because even though he was a patriot, like many of his peers, the word that the Lord had him give to the people was not a hopeful message. It was a message of judgment because of their many years of rebellion and disobedience. And so because of that, he was going to live and his ministry was going to last until Judah was destroyed, which was a, a terrible a position to be in uh, to all those years have this message of doom and live to see the doom and destruction that would come upon his own nation. So with that, let's begin uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord. Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations <clears throat> are dismayed at them, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot be moved, so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise, wise ones of, of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphas. They are the work of craftsmen in the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Bruce, what ways of the surrounding nations are they not to learn? Well, unfortunately, uh, from the very beginning, under Joshua, even under Moses, he warned them about being like the nations they were going in to conquer. And he warned them, don't become like them because literally the land is vomiting them out. And if you become like them, the same thing will happen to you. And of course, the root of the sins of the various nations all had to do with idolatry. Now here he makes fun of the literal idols that were made. He talks about how they were, first of all, start off with carved wood, then they get precious metals and, and coat the wooden statue, and then they put nails in it and nail it up so it'll sit up straight. Um, and it can't walk around, but they do carry it around from time to time. Um, even decorate it with uh, the most expensive of cloth. Uh, but there's a great deal of difference between these idols and the living God. The living God uh, is the creator God. And where idols can either do you good or harm, uh, the living God can bring his wrath upon you if you are a rebel and ungodly. 
Um, what's interesting in these verses is something we need you know, to sometimes remember. And that is um, when they talk about the literal idols they made, it's not that ancient people believe these idols were the gods themselves. Uh, they believed there were gods outside of the idols, but they built the idols because they wanted to show reverence and homage for the gods. And they did believe that if they built a sacred temple and it was uh, beautiful enough that they could coax the gods to come down and take some sort of presence uh, among them in the idols themselves. And they could show homage to them. They would literally bring food to feed them and drink to feed the idols. But it's because they believed there were uh, real spiritual beings and they were by idols trying to capture, if you will, the gods in these idols so that they could get the gods to do for them what they wanted them to do. But let's remember that uh, the Bible believes that there are a variety of sons of God, which are gods. They're part of the family of God that were part of the uh, rebellion against God and whom God put over the various nations and they failed to do their work. Let's note this in Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verses seven through nine. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his, Jacob has allotted heritage. So Jacob or Israel is the special heritage of God, but God put sons of God over all the nations and put boundaries on these nations from the very beginning. This, I think, refers back uh, to the rebellion that took place in Genesis chapter 11, uh, when we see the Tower of Babylon, and the people are split up and go to various directions and form their various nations. This is telling us that God put sons of God over each of these nations. And uh, so there really are spiritual beings called gods uh, that were over these nations, and the peoples tried to ensnare or trap these gods in the idols that they made in order to manipulate the uh, gods in order to get what they wanted out of them. Let's go on with uh, chapter 10 and pick up with uh, verse 11. Thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under heaven. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens and he makes the mists rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols for his images are false and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their, their punishment, they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob for he is the one who formed all things and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Bruce, why does Jeremiah speak in the Aramaic language in verse 11 rather than Hebrew? Well, you know, of course, we can't tell that from looking at the English uh, translation, and it's a very unusual occurrence. Uh, the Aramaic la language was, if you will, the popular language that was used among all the nations of the Middle East for hundreds of years prior to the time of Jeremiah. Uh, and eventually it became the language of the people of Judea once they returned to the land. Like for example, in the days of Jesus, he spoke Aramaic. Today, Aramaic is almost a dead language. There are only several hundred people that we can identify that still speak uh, Aramaic. But the same thing had happened to Hebrew. 
uh, the Hebrew language that the Jews spoke during the exile, they lost their capacity to speak it to one another. And so gradually Hebrew became a dead language in the sense that the Jews didn't speak it on a regular basis. They only quoted it when they read the Torah in the synagogues and sometimes when the more erudite of them would discuss matters of religion. Uh, but here I think he uses the Aramaic strategically because he's addressing these people of the nations. Uh, Jeremiah was only a prophet to Israel, but to the nations. Uh, Thus say you say to them, them who? Well, the nations. The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heaven. So these gods that have some power that idols are built to and temples are built to and nations all over the world, he says that these gods will be punished. It's not just the idols he's talking about, but he's talking about the gods themselves. Uh, and they don't have the power that God had. God created everything. God keeps everything working. Uh, people believe the Canaanites did that Baal, Baal, that he had the power to bring rain, and et cetera. But this is saying that's not really true. Uh, Baal did not have all that power. The one true God, the creator God had that. And he has one people, and that's the people of Israel. Uh, where in contrast to that, these false images uh, that are stupid and have no knowledge, um, have no breath in them, they're worthless and the works of delusion. But to get a vision of what God plans to do with these rebellious sons of God, we have to look to the book of Psalms. In uh, Psalms 82, just eight verses, it tells us about what God is going to do for these sons of God that have put, been put over the nation. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the God, in, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth for you shall inherit all the nations. So here is uh, God is calling together a meeting of his divine council, and he's calling these sons of God on the carpet for their bad behavior. Um, they're judging unjustly. They're showing partiality to the wicked. Uh, God wants them you know, to give justice to the weak and the fatherless. They're not doing that maintain the rights of people that are afflicted and people that are in poverty, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's the kind of justice God wanted these sons of God to bring about in these various nations they had some influence over, but they had failed completely at this. They don't have any longer any true knowledge and understanding. They've begun to walk in darkness. You are God's son of the most high, he says, Never at last, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So God is taking away from them any possibility of immortality. They're going to perish like the human beings, their influence. Now, they have lifespans that have, have gone over hundreds and hundreds of years, but eventually they're going to perish and they're going to be punished by God. So this is the backdrop to the understanding of the Jews about these nations and their idols. Um, they saw the total foolishness of the idols, not that they didn't believe that these gods existed, but they didn't consider these sons of God to be on par with the one creator God who was forever and will be forever, who is always on the side of justice and truth. And these sons of God had corrupted themselves and the nations that they had influence over. 
And so that's what uh, I think he's alluding to. That's why he uses Aramaic, I think, in this context uh, to speak to these nations uh, about their false images and reminds that there's only one real God and there's only one chosen people. And that's the people of God's inheritance, the people of Israel. So with that, let's uh, look at uh, verse 17, Paul. Gather up your bundle from the ground, O you who dwell under siege. For thus says the Lord, behold, I am slinging out the inhabitants of the land at this time, and I will bring distress on them that they may feel it. Woe is me because of my hurt, my wound is grievous. But I said, truly this is an affliction and I must bear it. My tent is destroyed and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me from me, and they are not, and, and they are not. There is no one to spread my tent again and to set up my curtains. For the shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore they have not prospered and all their flock is scattered. A voice, a rumor, behold it, is, behold it comes, a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah a desolation, a lair of jackals. Bruce, what is the Lord going to do and why? Uh, again, he's uh, said before, uh, this time he says again, a voice, a rumor, behold it comes, a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah a desolation. Um, you basically could invade Israel from either the south, and that would go through Egypt, or from the north. The Assyrians had invaded from the north and totally conquered the 10 northern tribes. Now the Babylonians were gaining power and overthrowing the Assyrians. And so now the Babylonians, when they would come to exert influence and to control Judea, they would ascend from the north. And the first thing, imagine you're kind of living in peace in your small little rural place where you're uh, farming or whatever, and all of a sudden you hear a big commotion. Maybe you look up and you see dust in the difference, distance. You hear suddenly a trumpet blowing, which is an alarm that an enemy is invading. Uh, it's too late. You can run and seek refuge in one of the fortified cities, uh, but he says they're going to lay siege to these cities. And they're going to completely destroy you, just like they're going to destroy a tent. And there won't even be any anything left of the tent. And your children are going to be gone and destroyed. And why is all this occurring? The shepherds are the reason. They are stupid. And they don't inquire of the Lord. Therefore, they can't prosper and their flock is scattered. Again, we've said before, oftentimes the Old Testament it refers to the shepherds. Is referring to the kings and princes, the royalty, the priests, and the prophets, the leadership of the people. And these shepherds were stupid in their thinking. They weren't looking to the Lord, inquiring from him about uh, what the will of God was. Instead, they were going about on their own. And that's why they couldn't prosper. And that's why eventually their flock, Israel, will be scattered, thus the exile that will take place. Um, and he's, you know, Isaiah is grieving over this. Uh, you know, Isaiah already feels the wound. He already feels the loss. Isaiah's, I'm, I'm excuse me, Jeremiah's all already uh, suffering grief over what he knows is going to happen, and he knows it because God has told him. But the people, they don't want to believe it. And you know what happens when somebody tells you something you don't want to believe? Just shrug it off. Go on your way. And Jeremiah can't shrug it off. Uh, Jeremiah knows uh, the terrible destruction is coming. Terrible affliction is going to come. And he knows, being a, a patriot himself, how terrible the disaster will be for his nation and his people, but he knows why it's coming, because his people have become like the Gentiles. They've become like all these other nations that are godless and immoral. It reminds me a little bit of what uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, 
about the behavior of the world of his day, uh, verse uh, 28 uh, to the end of the chapter. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And notice the, the root problem is uh, they don't see fit to acknowledge God. You know, they're not going to honor him. They're not going to thank him. They don't appreciate him, even though uh, the Jews are the very people of God that were given the land as a gift by God, but they show total contempt for God, uh, just like the other nations, also people made the image of God that have rejected God. What are they filled with then? Well, God allows them to live in a debased way, and do things they shouldn't do. So these nations, and Judah became like them, were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice, full of envy and murder and strife, deceit, and malice, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, evil, foolish, faithless. I mean, we just go down the list, reminds me of uh, the American culture. And over the years that I've been an adult, I've seen uh, increasingly uh, people not acknowledging the true God, and God is giving our culture over to be a, a debased mind and to do things we shouldn't do. And all these things that it lists here, we're a society full of uh, boastful people, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, heartless, ruthless, faithless. All these things increasingly characterize our own society as people decide not to acknowledge God. You know, your culture isn't destroyed the minute that people decide not to acknowledge God, but there's a kind of, the clock begins to tick and gradually people that at one time may have acknowledged God have grown up in homes where they did still have some leftover good morals that they were raised with, but gradually they began to become corrupted over time. And then their children, uh, grow up to be a godless and foolish generation. And so gradually over a generation, you see the moral rot in a society begin to erode the very cohesiveness of society. You see crime and violence becoming more and more common. And you see people cheating people. Um, I've paid a great deal of attention to it. There's a big a murder trial in South Carolina and some guy that was a big shot attorney and his family were well known there. Uh, he had uh, gotten on drugs. Uh, he had cheated everybody he could. I mean, he cheated a quadriplegic out of uh, just money and a settlement and, and now is said to have murdered his own son and uh, wife to try to cover up all his mess. I don't know exactly what he's guilty of. They'll have to decide that down there. But that's a kind of moral rot that happens. It appears that his father and his grandfather were good and honest people. But in one generation, uh, it eroded and it destroyed a family. And so I think the same thing's happening in our broader society. And just like in the days of Jeremiah, we have to warn people, when you cease to acknowledge the one true God, when you fail to be thankful, uh, you fail to honor and respect God, uh, it's not as if there's not going to be any consequences for that. There are consequences. They're not necessarily immediate, but there are consequences in people's individual lives and in whole societies. And I think we've begun 
to see that taking place in our own time. Let's go back and see what, uh, what Jeremiah had to say in chapter 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as at this day. Then I answered, so be it, Lord. And the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought up Therefore, I brought upon all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Bruce, what are the consequences of unfaithfulness to God's covenant? Well, it's, it's interesting. He brings up covenant here. And I think the reason for that has to do with what's taken place more recently in the history of the nation itself. Um, when we talk about the covenant of God, we're talking about the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel after God acted to bring them up out of what he calls an iron furnace of Egypt where they suffered as slaves, and he made them a free people, and he gave them the land of Canaan, and he made covenant with them, and all they had to do was obey his voice, and they said, on the day that God made covenant with them that they would obey his voice. But he's saying they've been unfaithful uh, to the covenant and there are going to be real consequences. To get a feel for what's unique about the time of uh, Jeremiah, let's keep in mind that he was called uh, to preach during the time of King Josiah. Let's read an instant, uh, interesting event uh, that took place uh, during the time of Josiah, 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8 through 10. I apologize for one second. 2 Kings 22, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Helkiah the priest has given me a book and Shephan read it before the king. Uh, so imagine the nation had gone away from God for so many years that the book of the law had gotten lost. And one of the things that uh, Josiah decided to do earlier was to go back in the temple. It was in disrepair and to repair it and bring it back to its Solomon glory. And in so doing, they found a book of the covenant. Uh, and they read it and were startled. And then they came and read it to the king. He was startled. He says, oh, my. He didn't realize how bad things were until he read the, the covenant law. Now, keep in mind, uh, their scriptures were not kept like ours are in a Bible where they have all the different books but they would be on separate scrolls. And one particular book would maybe, a, a long book would be on a lengthy scroll. They couldn't go further usually than one book. And uh, so we think based on the things that Jeremiah says that this was 
the book of Deuteronomy. And so this had gotten lost. And so no one was reading Deuteronomy. Nobody was telling the people about it. King Josiah, even though he's trying to be a righteous uh, king, didn't know what was in the book and was startled and had it read to the people. Let's look over chapter 23, 2 Kings uh, chapter 23, verse 1, 2. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. So he gathered the people together and read to them the book of the covenant. And uh, this allowed the people to know now what the king had not fully comprehended. And now they knew. So this happened uh, during the, about the time that Jeremiah was called uh, to be a prophet. And so the people now had scripture that they had lost. And now it had been found again. It got lost because no one cared what God had to say. They were doing their own thing. Uh, but now, once we have this in mind, now we can see why reading this, that Jeremiah might say what he's saying here, that you, you know what the Lord requires, and you know the consequences if you don't keep it. Let's look back now at Deuteronomy, and this would be one of the texts that would speak to this situation, uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, verse 15 uh, through 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So here Deuteronomy says, uh, God is the source of life and death to his people. Um, there'll be death if you practice evil, and life if you do that which is good. God just simply wants them to obey his commands, and all of his commands are for their good, and wants them to love God, honor God, walk in his ways, um, keep his statutes, then you shall live and multiply and you know be blessed in the land that God is giving you. But he warned them, if you go after other gods and serve them, I'm warning you today, you'll not live forever in this land I'm giving to you this day. <clears throat> he called heaven and earth to be his witness because only heaven and earth was going to be around hundreds of years later when God would want to witness to what he had said. And so he said, I've said before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that your offering may live. So <clears throat> the choice was there. It had always been their choice. The law had always been clear. God wanted a loving relationship, and that required them to acknowledge that God was wiser than they were, and God knew what was right and what they should do and what they should not do. All they had to do was be obedient children uh, to the clearly defined law of God. And God said, I'll bless you if you do it. But if you don't, if you choose to disobey, if you choose not to listen, if you go after other gods, because as the other nations worship many gods, then there are going to be consequences for you. You 
are not going to get to live in this land the Lord your God is giving you this day. So the people had been warned. They had recently had the book of Deuteronomy read to them before or about the time Josiah began his ministry. I'm sure during the days of Josiah at the festivals of the Jews, he would probably have it reread so the people would know what the will of God was and what that the choice was in their hand. Worship the one true God, love him and obey him, or worship the false gods and suffer death and desolation. It's your choice. But the choice was clear because God made it clear to them. So I thought it'd be uh, worthwhile for us to take a little journey to remember that they discovered the book of the covenant, which I think, based on all the things Jeremiah says, is probably uh, a scroll on the book of Deuteronomy. And so they were forewarned, therefore they were forearmed to be able to deal with their situation. They could have repented, they could have committed themselves like Josiah did to a righteous path. But it's very clear that even during the time of Josiah, people's hearts were not into the true worship of God. And after Josiah died, uh, the, the puppet kings that came up after him were compromisers and foolish men, and things went downhill in a hurry after the time of Josiah, because that's the way the people wanted it to be, unfortunately. Then let's uh, pick up with the next verses. Verse 9. Again, the Lord said to me, a conspiracy exists among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. For your gods have become as many as your cities. O Judah, and as many as the, the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to shame, altars to make offerings to Baal. Bruce, what conspiracies existed among God's people? Well, they conspired among themselves <clears throat> to have uh, an official position that we worship Yahweh, and they made sure that all the rituals in the temple went on the way they were prescribed, and they brought their things to the temple when they had to. They showed up on occasions when they were supposed to be. Uh, however, in their daily lives, they continued to worship many gods. Uh, in the excavations that have been done uh, in Israel uh, during this time period when they've excavated homes and gone down to this level or found cities who were only occupied at this time, the thing that shocked the uh, archeologist is how in almost every small house, uh, people had a number of false idols, little household gods that they worship. So, in their house, in their inner sanctum, they continued to worship many gods. Out on the streets, nobody saw it, and they would go to the temple, and they worshiped the one true God, too, so they were covering all their bets. You know, we, we've got a little money riding on Yahweh. We've got some money on Baal. You know, we're covered with all the different things that we worship, uh, but now he's telling them, because you think you can do this, and like you're pulling the wool over my eyes, you, you're conspiring against me, uh, there will be consequences. Uh, you've refused to hear my words and you've gone back and began to do the iniquities of your forefathers. So there may have been a period of time under Josiah when there was some reform, but very quickly they've all gone back to their old bad behaviors. And therefore the Lord says, I'm bringing disaster on you a disaster that cannot be prevented. And why don't you try crying to your gods then? Because they can't save you. For your gods have become as many as the cities of Judah, as the streets of Jerusalem or the altars you have set up to your shame. 
So at their heart, the Judeans were idolaters. Uh, we, when we think about that, sometimes we think, well, how horrible. They had these little things they worship this, that. Idolatry is more than that. Uh, anything that's as important or more important to you than God is an idol. In our society, for a lot of people, it's money. People will kill people for money. People will lie. People will cheat. Uh, so for some people, money is their God. Uh, for others, it's sex, and they are uh, devoted themselves to debauchery. Uh, for others, it's power, and they're playing the power game in, cor in the corporate world or uh, in the political realm. Whatever it is that's most important to you, that's your God. Now, the Judeans were polytheists. They continued to worship Yahweh along with the other gods they worship. And I think Americans are polytheists too. Some of them still claim to believe in Jesus and to occasionally go and to worship him. But if you follow their day-to-day -day life, it's clear that Jesus is not the Lord of their life. He's not the basis on which they make their decisions about their family, about their business dealings, about their moral life. Um, the sad thing about so many people is, even people that are relatively moral, if you get them out of their town, you get them to some other city where nobody knows them, uh, they behave any which way, which shows in their heart they were only conforming to expectations of others. They weren't really conforming uh, to that which was right and good and moral. And so that was the life of the Judeans. And it was finally catching up with them in a way that there was not going to be any cure for. Their idolatry had become endemic in their souls. And therefore, they had condemned themselves uh, to devastation for the future. Then let's pick up in verse 14. Therefore do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or a prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then exult? The Lord once called you, a green olive tree, beautiful with a good fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. Oof, Bruce, why did God tell Jeremiah to not pray for Judah? Well, you think, uh, surely at least you could pray for them. But now God tells him, no, Jeremiah, I know you've been praying, hoping that the people will repent and turn back to me. I'm telling you the time for hopefulness, for change in Judah is gone. I'm telling you, I don't want you praying anymore for them because I'm not going to listen to it. And I'm not going to listen to their cries. Uh, you know how it is, uh, you know, all of a sudden the, the atheist uh, gets in the trenches and he thinks he's going to die and he calls on God. All of a sudden he, he's lived a, a selfish and a foolish life, but he thinks he's going to die and he calls on God in a, in a, when he thinks he's going to die in an emergency. Well, this people, no doubt before it's over, when the Babylonians come, are going to call out to the, the Lord to save them. But they're like the atheist that's lived his foolish life. And now in a moment of dread before he faces death, he suddenly calls on the God he's ignored, rejected, refused. And the Lord is saying, I can't hear you. I won't hear you. And I won't even hear an intercessor, a righteous man like Jeremiah, that would seek to intervene on your behalf. Because of their terrible consistent, uh, idolatrous, and immoral behavior, God said, you're provoking me to anger. 
and here you continue to make offerings to Baal. No, you can't go and make sacrifices in my house and temple and make up for all this idolatrous behavior and immoral behavior. None of that makes up for that. And so Jeremiah has only, unfortunately, a word of judgment to give throughout the streets of Jerusalem and throughout the cities of Judea. So he'd gone on his tour of the cities, he'd gone on his tour of the streets of Jerusalem. And here we began to read uh, in the coming verses about the consequences uh, for Jeremiah for proclaiming this word of judgment, the word of the Lord to the people of Judea. Let's pick up at verse 18. The Lord made it known to me and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me. They devised schemes saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. But O Lord of hosts who judges righteously, who tests the hearts and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of uh, Anathoth, who seek you, who seek your life and say, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and none of them shall be left. For I will bring disaster upon the men of Anathoth, the year of their punishment. Bruce, as a result of Jeremiah's preaching, what did his hometown seek to do to him? Well, you know, you think, well, maybe one place that uh, Jeremiah could go, that maybe people would listen to him with a sympathetic voice, that they would care about him, that would be his hometown, which was a small city north of Jerusalem, Anathal. Uh, but he says, the Lord made known to me. Uh, I didn't know but he showed me what was going on. I was like a gentle lamb. I was going on almost to the slaughter. I didn't know that these people were devising schemes on how they could get rid of me, how they could kill me, uh, so that I would have no one, no descendants to remember my name. I would be forgotten. And so Jeremiah is shocked when God reveals to him that his you know, the people of Judea are beginning to devise plans to kill him. And even worse than that, the people of his own hometown. Um, Therefore, thus says the Lord, turn the men of Anathal who seek your life. What do they say to Jeremiah? Don't prophesy in the name of the Lord or you will die by our hand. Why are they saying that? Because they don't want to believe his message. And they think if they can shut him up, then maybe this won't happen. If somehow Jeremiah doesn't say this, then bad things won't occur. You know, they don't want to hear it. It's not a positive message. Uh, it's not what they anticipate will happen because they have a lot of hubris and think that they're wonderful and great and God can't possibly allow a terrible destruction to come upon us. And there are other prophets saying the opposite. They're saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Peace and prosperity. Uh, you can defeat your enemies. Don't worry. The Lord will be with you. That's not the message Jeremiah is telling them. And so they say, shut up. If you don't, we're going to kill you. Um, and the Lord tells Jeremiah, I am going to punish them for what they've plotted against you. Their children are going to die. A terrible destruction is going to come on Anathoth along with the rest of the people. They've plotted to kill you but God's not going to allow them to be successful in their plots. Uh, and God is going to defend Jeremiah and allow Jeremiah to be a message of God to the very end. And so when I think about this, this event, and here Jeremiah uh, goes to his hometown and discovers they're trying to kill him, and they tell him to shut up, it reminds me of Jesus when after he'd begun his ministry, uh, he goes back to his hometown and goes to the synagogue and reads a scripture out of Isaiah. And uh, Luke chapter four tells us what takes place next. 
Luke 4, and let's pick up verse 20. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out, that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. So where do you think uh, that idea had come to uh, Jesus? Well, he read the scriptures. He read from Isaiah this particular day, not Jeremiah, but he knew that Jeremiah wasn't welcome in his hometown. Worse than not being welcome, uh, they tried to kill him. They plotted uh, to kill him because of what he said. The same thing was happening to Jesus. Um, they were saying, well, we heard you've done miracles, but you haven't done any of those here, so mm -hmm. you know, we want to see the miracles. We want you to do something and show, show yourself to be powerful. But Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled. What was this scripture? It said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, to send me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set liberty to those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so he was the anointed one. Mm -hmm. That's the word for the Messiah. And uh, they began to pick up on that. And then he mentions about how God showed compassion on the Gentiles, which was not what his hometown synagogue wanted to hear. So let's look a little later, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 28. When they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Well, the same sort of thing happened uh, to Jesus. It happened to Jeremiah. They drug him out to the edge of their small village. I've been to that spot. Uh, the modern day Nazareth is a fairly big, predominantly uh, Arab city of about 50, 60,000 people. Uh, but where the old city was, was closer to this cliff. And now they've, they've, they've uh, got a road that goes right to the edge of that cliff where they would have taken Jesus and threatened to throw him off, which would have been his immediate death if he'd fallen off that cliff, being thrown off it. But notice Jesus walked through the crowd went on his way. God didn't allow Jesus to be killed. It was at his time. This was the way he was going to die. He didn't allow those that plotted against Jeremiah and Anathal to succeed at their plot, or the others that we'll find out as we go further, plotted and tried uh, to get rid of Jeremiah. God made Jeremiah, just like Jesus, a continuing living word of God to his people. And so I think as we think about Jeremiah and Jesus, I think we have to have some sober reflection. If you and I are going to be witnesses to the good news of Jesus, uh, we also may run into opposition. We may run into opposition in our own family, our own relatives, our neighbors, others uh, that don't have the same love and respect for God that you do. But we, like Jeremiah, uh, can't compromise our mission, can't compromise the message. We have to be willing, along with him, to stand up for the word of God and the truth of God and not be afraid of people that may oppose us. I hope we will take heart and courage from the example of Jeremiah and then again the example of Jesus as he said words that his hometown synagogue didn't want to hear. They tried to kill him, but God protected him. God will be with us too and protect us if we're willing to be courageous in our proclamation of the message of God. John, would you pray for us that we can be courageous in standing firm for the message of proclaiming 
the message of God. Father in heaven, we once again approach you most humbly, Lord, acknowledging that you are truly God and beside you there is none other. We thank you for your son, Jesus, our salvation, our resurrection in our life. And Father, we thank you for the comfort and guidance and discerning power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that we enrich his uh, presence in us through our daily sacrifice and devotion to you. Father, we pray that as this world would tug at us through the desires of our flesh to try to sway us over to idolatry, that our eyes, flesh, and pride may not overtake us. We pray, Lord, that we are steadfast and unmovable on your word, that we might boldly and courageously walk through this life proclaiming the name of your son, Jesus, for he is our life and he is more powerful and greater than the enemy in the world. And Father, we thank you that we are not here doing this alone, That, but we have fellow soldiers, believers in you uh, beside us to support one another, to build one another up when we're torn down, that we might make it through this time together in anticipation of spending eternity one with another. We thank you for the promises that you've made us and the faithfulness of your promises. And Father, we uh, once again pray that those who don't know Jesus and the pardon of their sins will come to that realization that they need Christ in their life and answer the call and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And Father, we thank you for your servant Bruce and his ability to teach us uh, so plainly your word. We thank you for each soul here and we pray our hearts are softened that your word may, may germinate within us and bear good fruit. And Father, we pray for those who are in need of your loving care, both spiritually and physically. So, Father, we ask that you bless us, keep us, and guide us for this prayer is asked in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.